Airborne operation is a joint undertaking which employs transport aircraft to convey a combat force into an objective area where they are airdropped or air landed on or near their objective. Airborne operations are characterized by close and continuous joint cooperation, planning, and coordination including the exchange of liaison officers at various levels of command. A sound and simple plan is used, which will retain its structure irrespective of the difficulties involved. The establishment of a joint task force is essential for the planning and conduct of airborne operations. The Joint Task Force Commander commands all assigned elements and is responsible for directing and coordinating the operation, including the resupply and the link-up or extrication of the force. The Airlift Commander commands the airlift units and is responsible for the air movement stage of the operation. He determines the technical parameters of the lift, including the run-in direction and the marking of the DZs. Morning, sir. The Airborne Force Commander carries out the mission and is responsible for the detailed planning and conduct of all activities relating to the Airborne Force, including the selection of the main assault and alternate DZs. The coordination of fire support is the responsibility of the Task Force Artillery Commander, who operates from the Force Fire Support Coordination Center. Fire support mainly involves in-range corps and division artillery. Close air support aircraft, attack helicopters, and the airborne forces organic artillery and mortars. The fire plan is based on a timed program with support provided from outside elements until the forces artillery and mortars are operational and the objective area has been seized. Control of fire is initially exercised directly by the pathfinders, fire controllers, and forward observation officers of the airborne force. Two zero rounds. After landing, the control of fire is exercised through the FSCC. Airspace control is effected through the appropriate theater agencies, which provide air corridors to the objective area and control zones covering the departure airfield and the objective airhead. Tactical air support plays a vital role in airborne operations. It encompasses photo reconnaissance missions which provide air photos of the objective area, including the DZ and the enemy positions. Missions allocated to suppression of enemy air defense fire, which are flown over the objective area just before the landing. Close air support sorties, which may be employed to assist in isolating the objective area especially with respect to any nearby enemy armor forces and engaging any hardened point targets providing difficulties to the assault elements and local air superiority which must be achieved both en route to and over the objective area. Electronic warfare support may also be used to disrupt enemy communications and gain knowledge of the enemy's counter-attack activities. Airborne forces incorporate characteristics which differentiate them from conventional forces, with emphasis being placed on the special spirit of the individual to complete the mission. They are adapted to move by transport aircraft over great distances, avoiding obstacles and achieving surprise. They are trained to react to a variety of operations with a minimum of delay and are lightly equipped to meet the requirements of the mission and the environment. They can be air-landed or dropped by parachute, and their light scales make them ideal for helicopter-transported operations. They are capable of moving over difficult terrain on foot as a self-contained entity. Airborne forces can be effectively employed in areas which restrain the operations of conventional forces. Airborne forces pose a severe threat to enemy rear area installations and their use can create a shock effect out of all proportion to their size, firepower, and numbers for a short period of time. Airborne forces suffer the inherent limitations of aircraft unserviceabilities, adverse weather and drop zone conditions, 
a lack of up-to-date and extensive intelligence, and heavy losses which can be occasioned by enemy fighters, air defense weapons, and ground fire. Airborne forces are vulnerable to counterattack by enemy mechanized elements and will quickly feel the effects of any disruption in resupply operations. In addition, a delay in link-up, relief, or extrication will place the force at hazard. Thorough briefings also assist individuals to attain their objectives should they become dispersed or separated, with every paratrooper being prepared to carry on with his portion of the mission. SOPs allow for rapid reaction to a mission requirement and provide for essential control features, such as DZRVs, fire support coordination lines, link-up and extraction points, and key timings. Communications are a particular concern in an airborne operation. It should be assumed that the enemy will attempt to disrupt the main links and that key radios may not arrive or might be damaged during the drop. Minimum numbers of vehicle mounted radios will be available and reliance will have to be placed on man pack equipments and flare signals to help in communicating with the aircraft. The higher level radio communications requirements include the task force command net linking the airborne force headquarters to the JTF HQ, the force administrative net to deal with resupply matters and aircraft movements, and the force fire control net to coordinate all fire support requirements. In addition, at the airhead there would be various ground to air nets for control of arriving transport aircraft and close air support sorties, and internal command fire support and administrative nets to handle the needs of the landed force. Uh, eight, this is zero. Acknowledge my last over. The three major locations in an airborne operation involve the garrison location, the mounting base, and the objective area. The garrison location is the home base of the airborne force, encompassing its barracks, command and training facilities. It also includes the applicable base support infrastructure and communications, which serve to support the assembly, administration, and staging of the force. The base organizes personnel and technical departure assistance groups, which help prepare the force for its move. The mounting base includes the departure airfield, an operations site, transit camps, storage dumps, medical facilities, and the communications, administrative, and logistic services to support the operation. The objective area includes the airhead with its DZs, echelon site, and the force objectives. Planning for an airborne operation is carried out in the reverse order of execution. It involves the ground tactical plan, which assigns the objective and determines the combat force needed to accomplish the mission. The landing plan, which details the sequential delivery and assembly on the ground of the different components of the force and its equipment. The air movement plan, which provides the information on the movement of the force from the departure airfield to the drop or landing zones. And the mounting plan, which deals with marshalling of the force at the airhead, as well as the briefing and preparations for the operation and the loading of aircraft. The preparation for and execution of an airborne operation generally falls into four phases. The mounting phase starts with the receipt of the warning order or planning directive. During this phase, joint planning is completed. Troops, equipment and supplies are assembled and readied. And briefings and rehearsals are conducted. Marshalling also takes place and includes the movement of troops, supplies, and equipment to the mounting base, where they are loaded into transport aircraft. The air movement phase begins with the takeoff of the tactical transport aircraft from the departure airfield and involves a stream of aircraft carrying the assault, reserve, and support groups. It ends with the delivery of the last aircraft load to its designated drop zone or landing strip. 
This phase also includes the insertion of pathfinders, which are normally employed in advance of the assault force. A pathfinder group is allotted to each DZ. The group normally consists of a commander, a DZ controller, a fire controller, two recce detachments, and a signaler who handles the rear link communications. It might also include a medical assistant and an engineer recce and work party. Initially, the tasks of the pathfinders are to infiltrate the perimeter of the objective area, recce assigned locations, and to confirm the suitability of the DZs. During the para assault, they call in airstrikes and in-range artillery fire, assist with the control of the DZs, and provide security until the force can concentrate on the ground. If they cannot be inserted until just before the assault, their scope is limited to DZ control and the direction of any available fire support. The landing phase begins with a drop of the force on the DZ and extends through the securing and consolidation of the airhead. It also includes any elements which are air landed on a protected LZ. The ground tactical phase covers the employment of the force once it is on the ground and the subsequent land battle. The criteria for the selection of a drop zone includes the closeness of the DZ to the objective, which facilitates the recovery of stores and heavy equipment and allows for the capture of the objective before the enemy has time to react. The size of the DZ, which must relate to the numbers of troops and stores being dropped. An area approximately 2,000 by 600 meters would be suitable as a main or alternate DZ. The surface of the DZ, which should be relatively level so as to reduce landing injuries and the complication of handling overturned platforms. Additional criteria involve the airlift force, which must be satisfied that they can locate and identify the DZ from the air under the expected visibility conditions. The location and strengths of enemy ground defenses, and particularly those which can interfere with the assembly and movement of the force, and the drop, which must take place clear of any enemy anti-aircraft weapons, or where it is feasible to implement an intensive program to suppress enemy air defense weapon systems. The DZs are marked by pathfinders just prior to the arrival of the lead aircraft. They use a letter identifier, which also locates the impact point. A lead-in marker may also be required. At night, these markings consist of colored lights or flares and electronic aids assist in conditions of poor visibility. Extraction zones and landing strips involve the same fundamental criteria as DZs, but require additional marking. The impact area of an EZ is approximately 300 meters in length, not counting approach and climb-out zones. It is marked with a code identifier, release, impact, and climb panels. A landing strip requires at least 1,200 meters of usable runway length. It is marked with a coded identifier and with orange panels by day and green, red, and white lights at night. Smoke may be used to indicate wind direction and velocity. The main types of tasks assigned to an airborne force include seize and hold missions, area interdiction operations, and raids on enemy locations. A force may also be involved in air mobile, deep patrol, and rear area security operations. Seize and hold missions can be conducted close to the FIBA, well within range of artillery and attack helicopters, or in depth along an offensive axis. These missions involve a parachute or air-landed assault onto or as close as possible to an objective, seizing it and then reorganizing and holding until link-up or relief takes place. Assaults may be conducted against major road, bridge, defile, or urban locations that might prove to be a serious choke point 
to an advancing force. They could also secure landing areas, key terrain, and airfields as a phase of an offensive operation. An air-landed assault, or the immediate follow-up lifts to a parachute assault, involves tactical aircraft with combat-loaded troops ready to deplane into action. These troops are not normally expected to engage in combat immediately upon landing. Air-landed units are mainly made up of conventional forces, which must be trained and equipped for a lightly scaled operation. Air-landed elements should be offloaded as close as possible to the objectives to be engaged or to the troops being supported. Supplies and equipment are delivered at a pre-planned rate to locations on the airfield which will require a minimum of additional movement and handling. An air-landed operation would normally involve a specially trained Air Force air traffic control team, which is brought in as soon as the airstrip is serviceable. The team can be operational within two hours of landing. It provides for the control of all air traffic at the objective airfield, including the provision of letdown, traffic pattern, taxi, and takeoff instructions. Area interdiction operations are planned at the highest level and are designed to prevent or hinder enemy activities within a given area. Interdiction operations involve raids, ambushes, mining, and sniping, which are mainly directed against industrial facilities, military installations, and enemy lines of communications. They cause the enemy to commit large forces for rear area security duties and generally have a demoralizing effect on his troops. These operations are best undertaken in terrain that restricts the off-road mobility of enemy forces and which favors concealment. Targets for interdiction operations include transfer points, tracks and rolling stock, vehicle compounds, aircraft and airfield facilities, shipping, port installations, as well as selected bridges and defiles, communication centers and transmission interlinks, power plants and transformer switching stations, fuel storage, refinery and pipeline equipments, key components of specialized industrial plants, and headquarters, military stores and maintenance entities. The area assigned to the interdiction force is divided into sectors with a subunit responsible for all operations within a given sector. The sectors provide space for maneuver to prevent the force from being trapped and to permit the early detection of enemy search and destroy parties. The force would normally enter the area with its accompanying supplies and facilities. Additional requirements would be later delivered to selected locations Supply problems can be offset by using captured enemy stocks and by living off the land. Communications difficulties caused by the dispersion of the force can be eased by the use of long-range radios. Airborne raids are planned at the highest level and the size of the force is kept to the minimum. A raid constitutes a surprise attack by parachute or air-landed assault. It may operate independently or in conjunction with friendly guerrilla units. Objectives suitable for airborne raids may either be deep in enemy territory or relatively close to the FIBA. These include command posts and headquarters, communication centers, transport networks, airfield installations, key enemy personnel, supply installations and facilities, PW enclosures, intelligence targets and the like. The raiding force is generally organized into an assault element which accomplishes the mission, a support element which provides and coordinates the required support, a security element which seals off the objective, and a reserve. Airborne raids are preferably carried out in conditions of poor visibility, which facilitate surprise. They are executed as swiftly as possible. 
the raiding force is either extricated before the enemy can react, or it may remain and carry out an area interdiction operation. The bulk of the airborne forces supplies are handled by their integral tactical air movement sections. These sections prepare cargo and equipment for delivery, assist with the loading and with the dispatch of airdropped stores, layout and mark follow-up cargo DZs and EZs, control activity on the ground, and help clear away cargo after the drop. Supplies provided to an airborne force are categorized as accompanying, follow-up, and routine supplies. Accompanying supplies are those carried by the troops in support of the assault. They are issued early to allow for their preparation for air movement. Accompanying supplies include loads which are carried on the individual, wedge loads which are dropped in conjunction with personnel, door loads which are pushed out ahead of a stick of paratroops, CCC-1 loads which are handled by aircraft equipped with a container delivery system, medium equipment loads that are gravity extracted from the aircraft ramp, and parachute extracted heavy equipment platforms that go in with the assault force. Accompanying supplies also include prescribed loads and any additional items which are brought into the airhead by oncoming echelons at their time of entry. Quantities and natures of follow-up supplies are based on an estimated daily expenditure and include on-call items which may be quickly provided to satisfy emergency requirements. They are delivered after the parachute assault in accordance with a planned program. In certain instances, Specialized natures of heavy bulk items, such as ammunition, would be dropped directly on the gun position to reduce ground handling. Routine resupply is a result of normal requisitioning procedures, replacing combat supplies, and other stores which have been expended, or to increase reserve stocks. These would normally be delivered by transport aircraft. All aircraft loads are inspected and certified by Air Force Air Movements personnel prior to loading. MAMS crews then move the loads to the aircraft, maneuver them aboard, and hook them up in accordance with the load table requirement. Airborne operations require considerable joint planning and control at all levels of command, and a great deal of material support. They are naturally risky and susceptible to the whims of weather, aircraft unserviceability, and to destruction by undetected enemy armored forces and air defense weapons. With sound intelligence, good planning, and the proper use of the force, an airborne operation can achieve results far exceeding the actual expenditure of resources.